Um, that was an amazing panel. It was great to see um, really the, the work that's happening at the local level and you know, hear from those individuals that are, that are doing it. Um, but I'm very excited um, to bring you all to um, more of a global perspective. Um, so at the ASA conferences, we're always covering uh, cannabis from uh, the perspective of different stakeholders, but also uh, from um, everything from the municipal level um, all the way to the international level. And when we began uh, Americans for Safe Access, uh, really outside of a, a small, some small programs in Canada, the US was really the only um, country in the world that was um, approaching cannabis policy. And we started seeing um, countries like Holland come, come on board with programs, um, but it's really been the last few uh, years that, that medical cannabis has been a global topic. And uh, as I mentioned in my opening remarks, uh, I had always assumed that we were we were going to win at the federal level, change federal uh, policies before uh, we would see movement at the international level. Uh, but we're actually seeing, um, we're now up to 40 countries that have medical cannabis laws and they're all experimenting with little different programs. Uh, so we're gonna hear from individuals that have been uh, working in those markets to give us a little insight um, of of some lessons that we can learn from, from those policies. Uh, then, you know, actually here in North America is one of the only places in the world where we're having to deal with this phenomenon of um, medical cannabis uh, states, or, or in the case of Canada, country um, that moved into uh, recreational policies uh, while the medical cannabis policies were in place. So we're gonna hear a little bit about how that's been going in Canada. Uh, as well as hearing about some of the really exciting movements um, that we've seen at the World Health Organization uh, and what that means for uh, UN policies in the future. Uh, when, when we started Americans for Safe Access, we created a strategic plan where we were looking at every, everything that impacted medical cannabis policy in the United States. And one of those policies was of course uh, the international policies around cannabis. And as we were devising strategies uh, to move safe access forward, the international component was one that we saw as maybe far off or you know, something we would do after we, we, we passed federal laws. But we began uh, looking for allies and began uh, working on, on influencing the World Health Organization as well as lobbying at the, the UN level. And it's pretty exciting to see how far uh, that advocacy has, has moved the needle <clears throat> in, uh, in very uncertain times. Uh, and then we're also um, going to hear and discuss um, what changes at the UN level will mean, what, um, what that would actually mean to uh, federal laws, what that could mean for um, our, our brothers and sisters globally. Do you know Americans for Safe Access is a project that we started in, in 2014 uh, called the International Medical Cannabis Patients Coalition, where we work with patients around the world, uh, both to help them pass laws in their own countries, um, but specifically to work on, on changing international policies. So I wanna say thank you uh, to our panelists. Uh, we're gonna hear from a really uh, diverse group um, with, with uh, diverse perspectives on these issues. So our first speaker, uh, is actually a ASA board member. I think you guys have seen him speak at a few of the, the ASA conferences. Of course, it's Nick Easley. Uh, Nick is the CEO and founder of 3C Consulting. Uh, this firm works on medical cannabis, not only in the United States, uh, but globally, and also works on recreational and hemp as well. Uh, they have been working in uh, over 34 states, 17 countries. And so Nick brings uh, to us a, a very unique perspective on how medical cannabis is unfolding globally. So with that, I'll, I'll hand it over to Nick. Welcome, Nick. Well, good morning, everybody. Um, you can see me as a normal professional there in normal life during Corona life, uh, coming to you from here, a nice, uh, wonderful childhood home in Wisconsin. Never thought I'd have the opportunity of working and running companies from uh, 
my father's pajamas from the 70s, but I took off my bathrobe this morning um, and sharing my apocalypse beard with you all here. So wishing you all a great morning. Would have been fun to be with, with everyone in DC in the tulips uh, there, but I think this is a little bit safer. So I think we're all more than six feet apart. Um, to share a little bit just on background, you know, I never thought I'd get to do what I do or know and participate how I do on an international level when it comes to medical patients and access. So after I got out of the military as a disabled vet, I went to Colorado in 2006 and really as a ski bum was exposed to medical cannabis. But in that area, some of those caregivers that were giving medicine to patients, I started to help them get the first commercial business licenses. So we did that then in Colorado and a few other states and then moved to start getting licenses for medical cannabis production in Canada, in Denmark, in Portugal, in Germany, in Colombia, in South Africa, you know, all over the world. So really had to understand how does international drug policy relate with like US drug policy and they're completely different at this point. So some of the lessons that I've at least learned so far is that the United States, we're a little archaic when it comes to our clinical trials, our actual true medical cannabis research from a pharmaceutical drug development standpoint. So something that I learn with a lot of my international projects is knowing I'm dealing with like the CND, I'm working with the WHO, I'm working with the UN, certain sorts of policies and guidelines when it comes to actually standards and standard development. And in the US and what ACE has done with PFC, absolutely incredible. Now internationally, I have GAP, like good agricultural practices, good manufacturing practices, EU current good manufacturing practices, good distribution practices, good laboratory practices. When you look at Oregon or Colorado or California and the medical standards or the rec standards for the adult use markets, they're here, you know, international standards are well, they're, they're way, way up. So what I've learned that we can really learn in the US is look to international policies when it comes to standards for drug development and production, because that's where it's actually happening from a realistic pharmaceutical drug development standpoint, creating like bulk APIs, um, like active pharmaceutical ingredients, which we all know that this plant is extremely medicinal and for so many people, different reasons, but we don't know yet titration levels. We don't know specifically like this person with their body mass index, what this medicine will do X percent of the time. And that's what we're finding out in more and more of these countries because these other countries have really taken medical cannabis research much more seriously. And when we think about the biggest barrier to entry in medical cannabis in the US or internationally are doctors that are willing to write prescriptions for medical cannabis to patients. And it's been really hard for doctors to say, hey, smoke this plant material, even though I don't know how much you should smoke or this concentrate or how much butter or how much Ring Simpson's oil, they, but they've been willing to do that as, as a safe and effective alternative. And we, we know cannabis isn't dangerous like the United States told us and the rest of the world how it was in the past. So we're a little behind when it comes to actually understanding like what is medicine, how doctors will use this. So the big thing that we should do in emulating many of our programs, the DEA is giving out many more research licenses now. It's not just NIDA that's putting forth some of these programs. So we can actually start to research medical cannabis in a whole different way with different types of preclinicals and clinical trials in the US, emulating what's being learned and what's already been learned in some of these other countries. Now, we always have to think if something's a PICS country, if it's gonna be allowed to meet um, F FDA standards for imports of drugs, just like an Epidex or some other like pharmaceutical product from cannabis. Because right now, just like in the United States and most, inter well, all international countries, we're still following compassionate use. We don't know exactly what works, how it works, but we know something works. So at least the risks outweigh, the risks are outweighed by the benefit and doctors are able, able to write these prescriptions. And it's been low and more uptick is happening in more countries. But the big thing that I'm sure um, Dr. Pavel and Pavel Pakta and some others will mention later on today is what's really significant with this UN vote that has now been delayed twice, um, which essentially when we can change the scheduling of medical cannabis on an international level with the UN, of which the United States is a member, we actually can kind of the silver lining here is actually get the US to change some of their drug policies based on their memberships with these single conventions and single treaties on psychotropic substances, kind of a mouthful. So when that happens, if doctors are then required or if doctors have like write a prescription for medical cannabis in a country, 
their country has to allow that just like an opiate or just like any other sort of controlled substance to be either allowed to be manufactured and produced in their country or to be legally imported. And to think of over 180 some countries having to change their policy compared to the few that allow domestic production and which ones allow like export and import, this will change the game. But the DEA has been uh, not the best on some of the research and what they've allowed us to do over the years. And unfortunately, we can't just take cannabis from one place, you know, and move it to another. Internationally, we can if it's, you know, produced with all the COAs correctly. But in the U.S., we just can't do that yet. The other thing that I think we can really learn from some of these international policies currently is how patient groups are really advocates. I mean, you look at ASA, almost two decades old. Amazing what we've done. I mean, and just a big props up to ASA and all the members for what's happened this last week to think of over 22 state governors saying that cannabis is an essential business. That's a, that's a big deal. I, I mean, for this to happen, more delivery, more curbside, more pre-order pickups, like the industry's changed immensely in the last two weeks. And we have a lot of you know, issues coming up based on these current, current times. But this kind of silver lining of knowing that we have states now calling this essential, not just allowing this, but deeming this essential. If there's a way through any of this that we can get our federal government to see that there is medical value in cannabis, it's a direct argument with our controlled substances policy. So I think we're not gonna do a first mover advantage in the US of changing that scheduling. But I think once this happens on the UN basis and then this trickles down to all member nations of which we're a part, quid ex post facto, we're gonna to have to change our policy, which is pretty spectacular. So I know that that's a main, main thing that I'm really excited about, but the advocacy groups, how ASA has done a great job with PFC, like patient focus, you know, trainings and certifications in other countries of really how can ASA take more of an international stage and our advocacy groups, how we're already working together with other nonprofits in the space, but there's coalitions and groups like this in France, surprisingly in Russia, surprisingly in many of these countries that I think we can help provide them some of our you know, the great things that we've produced, you know, as an organization over the years on how we're actually analyzing our programs and support, or I mean, from our, you know, state type policies, giving them the information that they need. And also specifically with doctor education, the more doctors that we can educate internationally, we'll begin making more prescriptions and us here at home, how to educate our doctors as well. ASA, one of the biggest things you can do as an advocate is the voluminous resources on our website for ASA that are kind of rules for regulators or resources for doctors and resources for patients. Like each person that's going around and teaching more doctors about, you know, not just saying like CBD is gonna cure cancer and the coronavirus and everything else it can cure, but backed up peer reviewed medical science, peer reviewed data that's actually talking about cannabis and autism. And all of the times over the last 40 years it's cited in, in published research. That's what doctors look at. And we need to be better advocates instead of getting behind some of these false claims. And even though we know medical cannabis is so medicinal and important, we have to use the data, the facts and the information to arm ourselves as advocates, as well as to arm our future allies of the medical benefits of cannabis and never forgetting here in the US, even though we have so much revenue coming from the adult use sales, that medical cannabis is what started this. And as other countries like Canada and Uruguay start to legalize cannabis on a recreational basis, never forgetting that this is medical cannabis and where it comes from. And we'll have some very hard choices to make here in the United States over this next, this next quarter, essentially, as some of these adult use markets are stripping supply from medical markets. And how do we really defend patients? Some great protections for medical cannabis has come through recently, but we really need to arm ourselves with what's being done and learned in other countries for how that can help here. How we as advocates here and the great things that we've done, and we need to not take our foot off the, the gas here, there's still states that don't have medical cannabis policies, even CBD type programs, like non-psychoactive, until every single state and territory in the United States has some sort of medical cannabis program, our job's not done. And then even then, it's not done because the rec markets will start to step on patient rights. So we always need to be the biggest advocates for the medical cannabis patients, because even at the end of the day, I think there's a lot of anxiety and stress in the world right now. And many people that are stockpiling cannabis from the adult use markets are using this medicinally as well at this time. We all have the same endocannabinoid system. Some of us have cards, some of us don't. 
but we really need to bring that and carry that forward as we move uh, move to these next levels. And even in the U.S., for what's happening on the WHO level and with the UN level, we need to push our policymakers. We need to push our directives. We need to push our representatives to educate them so that when these votes come out, they're making the proper choices when it comes to the potential rescheduling or descheduling of medical cannabis on an international level. That's going to change business policies that will allow countries that are producing in Portugal or in Colombia to export to other manufacturing facilities, make standardized drugs and drug development. And no, we have to remember that this window that we're in right now of compassionate use, it's only going to go for so long. The things that we've gotten away with in the United States of making suppositories, transdermal, sublingual strips, like bona fide medical products, like without going through clinical trusting, like there's a moment that all of these businesses and brands are going to have to change to where the medical cannabis kind of as we know it is going to go into a whole nother kind of arena. And we really need to start to think how do we protect our patients from certain dangers and risks from new delivery methods. Um, we have no idea what concentrate of 99% does to someone or with compromised immune systems or now even with this big lung pandemic, how do we protect our patients here, not only from you know, fake vape type issues, but also that the things are being done in a safe and effective food grade manner where every other country has to do this, but they're doing it based on flour and bulk oil. That oil in Germany would then be compounded in a compounding pharmacy to make decarboxylated like little pills of flour or sublingual type strips or drops, but it's not the true products yet. So we really have a lot to learn in the United States. We've gotten away with a lot for our medical patients, but there is gonna be a moment that that compassionate use window is gonna to start to slow down and you'll move towards the more drug discovery, drug development, pharmaceutical type products, just like in Epidex or something in that nature. But you know, someday we'll be able to take medical cannabis from one place under certain standards and move it to another or the drug products and developed products, but without any sort of unified standards, we're, we're gonna be in trouble there. So we have, we're in a good place in the US. It's amazing what we've accomplished over these last two decades to think of medical cannabis now being an essential state business for many states and the revenue and the jobs that are being created and also patient access. But we still have to remember, even with all of these changes that will be coming internationally after like this December vote, which hopefully you know goes through, we have to be ready for that next wave and what we need to do to start doing drug development, drug discovery, and true clinical trials and medical research here in the United States, just like is being done and promoted in many of these other countries at this point. I'm not sure, Steph, if uh, there's any kind of follow-up or additional questions you maybe had for me at that point. No, we are, we'll do Q and A after we get through the speakers. So thank you so much, Nick. <laughs> All right, thank you. Our next speaker uh, is uh, Michael Krawitz. Um, Michael is the founder of um, Veterans for Medical Cannabis. He's also a uh, longtime ASA uh, supporter and ally. Uh, we've done quite a bit of work um, in the US and internationally, um, um, moving uh, forward the agenda, agenda of, of safe access. And Michael has also been a, um, a defendant in, in a few of our lawsuits and is, is actually uh, an award winner this year. Uh, so I'm sad that we're not gonna be honoring you at, a, at an awards dinner this year, Michael. Um, we're very excited to um, have you tell us a bit more about what's been going on um, at the WHO level. So, Michael working okay <laughs> all right great to see you Steph great to Hopefully see you. my audio is working good all right so um, let me kind of get my act together here I uh, really appreciate uh, everyone coming together uh, for this conference I appreciate uh, ACE's caution on uh, COVID-19 and having the uh, conference online seems to be a wise choice at this point um, I am Michael Krawitz. I live in uh, southwestern Virginia, and I'm the executive director of Veterans for Medical Cannabis Access, but I do hold a bunch of other uh, titles and board positions, and they seem to be growing at this point. Um, I was looking at the fellow panelists on this panel, and first of all, I, I'm just incredibly 
honored. I, I feel incredibly honored to be part of uh, this group, particularly. Um, and I was thinking there's sort of a little uh, mind puzzle I'll give you because uh, as I was looking at this particular panel with uh, uh, Pavel, Steph, Hillary, Nick, and me, uh, I believe that we are each not only mentors, but students in this little group. So each of us is a mentor to someone and a student of someone in this little group of ours. So a bright brain puzzle for you to figure out who's who, from my perspective at least. I, um, uh, like uh, Nick, came back a uh, disabled vet. Um, and uh, I think what I'm about to say will really complement well what Nick uh, just kind of filled you in on. And hopefully will be a, a good segue into what Pavel will talk about. Uh, and. Uh, sort of work together perfectly, especially with regard to the World Health Organization recommendations. Um, a little bit of history, I think, is, is in order just to kind of put this all into context and understand where we are. Uh, I think it's always good to understand the, the history, uh, at least from my perspective. I came into this pretty much in 1998. Uh, I'd already started working internationally and I'd actually did my due diligence as a cannabis activist to meet up with uh, Dennis Perrone and Jack Herr and Chris Conrad and a bunch of others to talk about international drug policy in the mid 90s. And to my surprise, there was really no one working on international drug policy from an international perspective, from the treaty perspective uh, inside the United States or inside the cannabis movement at large. Um, and uh, I, I became my sort of my mandate as a cannabis activist and I've worked on that ever since. Uh, one of my big trips where I learned an awful lot and met a lot of people was in uh, 1996, right around the time of Prop 215 in California. I actually received my first prescription for cannabis from the Netherlands, from medical doctors there. I was actually on a long trip. I was uh, going to be in Europe for three months. It was a replacement trip for a, a big Asian trip that I was never able to take in the military because of my disability and my injury uh, and, and my, you know, sh cutting short of my military service. I uh, decided to replace that with a Europe trip. And just as a matter of course, I thought it would be logical to establish a medical file in Europe so that if I ran into trouble in some country somewhere on a three month trip uh, across Europe, that there would be a, basically a local European doctor for me to refer to, for people to, to ask questions and, and to be able to follow my care. And to my surprise, when the doctor talked to me and asked me how I uh, you know, used pain medicine, how cannabis worked for me and, and, and uh, just you know, a very thorough examination, the doctor prescribed cannabis to me and was able to prescribe cannabis to me. I didn't even know that they were able to do that. At that time already, they were prescribing cannabis in the Netherlands and it was being delivered under a Mary Farm program. Uh, later, I received cannabis from the uh, Dutch government through the more modern uh, Bedrican program and uh, the Stichting marijuana program and uh, just about every Dutch uh, pharmacy program that they've had in my travels to the Netherlands, which was my first part of my international work. Um, 1998, I came back and I spoke at the United Nations in New York at this big drug summit. Uh, President Clinton was there, was, uh, like 88 world leaders were in the house. General McCaffrey upstaged everyone and landed on the roof in a Black Hawk helicopter. It was those kind of days. And I gave a speech at the, it was, it was called the United Nations Drug, uh, United Nations General Assembly Special Session, UNGAS is what they call these special sessions. And this was the special session on drugs in 1998. I think to my knowledge, the last big drug summit that we've ever really had uh, before that was 1988, and that was when we passed our last bad law. I'll get to that in a, in a minute. So I presented a speech in the NGO hall there in, in the drug summit in 1998, and it just occurred to me that my own country, the country that I served in the military, really didn't respect my medical needs at all. Um, the Netherlands, who didn't owe me anything, was respecting my medical needs, and that I could get cannabis from a pharmacy in the Netherlands, and it wasn't really a an issue, and then come back to the U.S. Back to this meat grinder policy. The you know the a, a, kind of coming towards the end, I guess, looking at it historically of the just say no period, it was horrible. So that was basically the beginning of working at the international level. I, I think Steph's right. For many years, uh, ten years or so, we didn't really work on cannabis policy inside the UN. We worked on access to meetings, 
and badges for access and working through the Economic and Social Council of the UN to get into meetings. And we actually did some things structurally. We recreated the New York NGO Committee on Drugs. We rebuilt the Vienna NGO Committee on Drugs, which are our sort of interface with the UN system from a non-governmental organization perspective. That's what we are, non-governmental organizations. And uh, 2008, we had a, a summit, wasn't quite like 1998, like I said, uh, but we were able to bring together all across the world, non-government organizations. And it just so happens our work for that 10 years to bring in the cannabis movement, to bring in the reform movement, to get them badges into the UN helped us be structurally part of this 2008 resolution and UN process of, uh, of uh, consensus in the NGO community. You're talking about thousands of NGOs consulted all over the world, many of them on cannabis, but all over the place on, on the, the spectrum of ideology and public health and harm reduction and drug access and abstinence and everything all thrown together. And we actually reached a consensus document, published it after such fanfare in Vienna. And that's become the basis for our conversation with the UN ever since. Um, as a manner of just quick history, and I think Pavel will talk more about it, we have three treaties uh, that we've signed into. The drug control treaties from 1961, 19, uh, what is it? Uh, a, a, seven, 1961, 1971, and 1988 are three drug control treaties that we signed on to. For those that remember Jack Herrer's book, The Emperor, and remember the whole story of Harry Anslinger, uh, the, at least the first treaty for sure is part of Anslinger's legacy. As I understand, uh, the history of, uh, of this from experts that have looked into it, it is believed that Harry Anslinger, our commissioner of narcotics, for the Federal Bureau of Narcotics in the United States, who was in 1961 our ambassador of the United Nations drug uh, effort uh, to work on this new treaty, actually was looking to sure up the constitutional authority of the Marijuana Tax Act. But the Marijuana Tax Act was still found unconstitutional in 1969, even though we did sign in the treaty in 1961. But the new law, the new Controlled Substances Act of the 1971, was full of the treaty uh, references and made good use of the, of the drug control treaty in basically establishing itself uh, constitutionally. It used the constitutional basis, a very circular constitutional authority of a treaty once ratified in the United States becomes federal law. It's part of our constitution. But the treaty itself, the text of the treaty, defers to our constitution. In other words, nothing in the treaty is to be taken to supersede or uh, should uh, be seen as uh, uh, competing with a national constitution. So very circular and those who have legal minds should be looking into that. How can we use such a circular logic to underpin some of the authority of our Controlled Substances Act? But anyway, our Controlled Substances Act is nonetheless written to implement the International Drug Control Treaty. And because of that, when we went to reschedule Marinol, we had uh, in the 1980s, the federal government of the United States allowed industry to create uh, Marinol, the synthetic copy of THC. The DEA doesn't really see any difference. It's THC to them. And it's treated just as any other THC would be under the treaty and under our federal law when they uh, were kind of instrumental in allowing industry to create a Marinol drug in the 1980s, that prompted the United States to try to change the treaty. Most people don't even know that, but we actually, as the United States, went to the treaty body and tried to change the treaty to reflect the changes that we saw we needed to make in order to make this THC drug available. That failed. In fact, multiple efforts to change the uh, status of THC, which is in the 1971 treaty, again, something Pavel, I think, will explain, um, they all failed. So uh, you know, we, we uh, get up to this point in time uh, where now we have uh, uh, cannabis that's uh, uh, you know, being looked at around the world <laughs> and uh, uh, kind of bubbling up in, in policy around the world. And uh, just very quickly, I'll tell you that the uh, history of this World Health Organization review process comes from Japan from 2009 
from their efforts to outlaw cannabis seeds in the International Drug Control Program. They uh, were instrumental in a resolution being passed along with Azerbaijan. And that resolution, I don't think they realized it would start this process, but it started a process where uh, it created this critical review opening for us. Uh, Steph and I were there to testify at the very first window of opportunity uh, to uh, try to get them to actually do a review. And we uh, helped change the fundamentally the panel's uh, uh, composition. We uh, helped to uh, elucidate the fact that Bertha Madras, Professor Madras was not fair and impartial and uh, she was actually taken off the panel. And we did get eventually years later a good outcome. Um, I think that it's important to understand what the treaty actually does limit in the United States as far as what we can do. And uh, under the Controlled Substances Act, because of the way the treaty is written into our law, uh, if we want to have uh, cannabis out of Schedule 1 or Schedule 2, it's been interpreted as uh, outside of our treaty obligations currently. If you want to have uh, cannabis grown by an individual uh, outside of the government's monopoly, as has been defined by the DEA, now redefined to mean that uh, you can actually grow outside the DEA prop, proper, but they have to actually constructively possess the cannabis. They have to buy it from the, the contractors that grow it. We haven't seen any contractors actually growing the cannabis for the government. Um, these are things that will change. Hopefully, if we do get the changes that we're looking at, uh, then that should under, uh, undercut the DEA's argument. We should be able to reschedule cannabis. In fact, it should start, as uh, Nick alluded to, a process by which uh, cannabis will be reassessed from the top down instead of the bottom up. And it's been the bottom up that we keep running into the DEA. From the top down, hopefully we won't run into the DEA. It'll be straight to the executive branch, right to the HHS. I wanna just quickly mention you know, the future of herbal medicine that we see is uh, in expanding traditional use. And we're now working on appellations of origin. And just very quickly, if you think about, if you buy a cannabis that says it's grown in California, you want it to actually be grown in California. You say it's cannabis from Jamaica, you want it to actually be from Jamaica. But even more than that, I'll leave you with this thought. As we're looking at medicines, as a patient, uh, you sometimes need very high doses. You're looking at very strong concentrates. And we now know that these concentrates can inadvertently carry uh, heavy metals and, and, and things from the soil that they're grown in. Think about it, where something's grown, the way it's grown, the practices that it's grown in is gonna reflect in that medicine and the quality of the medicine and how safe it is to take. Um, I think it's really important that we work on this. And, and you know, again, it complements, I think, what Nick said very well as far as standards. I wanna thank everybody. I thank uh, Americans for Safe Access so much for putting on this panel, uh, the International Medical Cannabis Patient Coalition, to which our organizations are members. We want to expand and uh, uh, increase communications amongst that network and get everyone to really see more of what the great IMCPC network is doing and, and talking about. And finally, I, th I wanna thank the World Health Organization who's really taken a stand for us and not just for us, uh, you know, as they go through all these new drugs and they may be working on things like carfentanil that they don't have any argument about, uh, you know, putting into control, they've actually taken a stand on not just cannabis, but ketamine, tramadol. They've taken a stand on behalf of patients, on behalf of the truth and the evidence, and they're fighting an uphill battle in the United Nations. They need our help. So listen to the emails, join in the communication with Steph and I, and I think that you're going to find that we can actually change the world together. Thanks so much, everybody. Thank you so much, Michael. And thank you for, for adding that comment. I think a, a lot of times, um, you know, we um, as advocates, we're constantly fighting and, and, and pushing against agencies to get heard. And it is important once we make it to the table uh, to really thank those agencies. And as Michael mentioned, the World Health Organization has gone above and beyond uh, um, around the issue of medical cannabis. Um, we actually, many of you, um, at, at ACES conference a few years ago, helped create a critical review uh, for medical cannabis that we gave to the World Health Organization. And uh, I was actually quite pleasantly surprised when we finally got the critical review authored by the World Health Organization um, that it, it actually took some quite radical steps, um, even further than, than some of us had hoped. Um, so Michael, thank you again for, for all of your work. Um, our next speaker, um, is, is currently serving as the Chief Advocacy Officer at Canopy Growth. 
She's been a great advocate uh, for the work in Americans for Safe Access. Um, but when I met um, Hillary, uh, I was actually advocating for her to stay out of jail. Uh, she was one of uh, the pioneers of medical cannabis advocacy um, in uh, Canada, uh, you know, bringing one of the first cooperatives um, to light there, serving, uh, again, uh, I believe, there's HIV patients and then really broaden that access model. So we're very excited to have her uh, join us today and tell us um, a bit about um, first her story, which is incredible, um, as well as the what she's seen as the process going from medical and rec in Canada. And then she's gonna tell us a little bit about some of the other work that Canopy Growth is doing in the field of patient advocacy. So thank you so much, Hillary, for joining us. Hello. Hi, Steph. Nice to see you. Nice to see all of you. I am so sorry and so glad that we're not in Washington, D.C. all at the same time. Um, we were really looking forward to coming and meeting you. There's a couple of other people from my team that are really committed to patient advocacy that are listening. So uh, hello to the rest of my crew that's on the line. I am at home um, in a little cabin in the woods on Salt Spring Island on the west coast of Canada. I spend about 80% of my time in airports and hotels these days traveling and teaching governments and physicians and doing whatever I can to keep moving the needle around medical cannabis. And so it's actually lovely to um, chat with you from my home. Um, I am here in some ways, I guess, representing industry. There's been a lot of conversation today about the role of uh, big corporations. And I am a one of the boss ladies of the biggest one in the world. So Canopy Growth, um, we're, we're operating in 16 countries. We're a multinational, multi-billion dollar publicly traded company. And for me, coming from very lefty, civilly disobedience, grassroots background, as things evolved in Canada, I chose to take a path um, to have a seat at the table where I wanted to have some influences over decisions that were being made and the way that resources were being spent. So um, it's interesting talking, hearing some of the conversation about the concerns about uh, vertically integrated companies of which, um, yeah, this, a lot of the concerns that I'm hearing about big companies are a part of what I uh, kind of navigate every day. But it, I come from a very different place. So when Proposition 215 passed in California, I realized that it was really time to get moving on medical cannabis in Canada. I had previously worked at the first hemp store in the country. And Michael, it's funny listening to you talk about Dennis and Chris and Jack. Those, I, I think, are some of the greats whose shoulders I feel like I stand on. They were some of my most important mentors. Um, so in the mid 90s, Vancouver was in the midst of a HIV and hepatitis C uh, health crisis, much like the health crisis previous to COVID, the health crisis that we were, are in is around opioid overdose, the opioid overdose epidemic, but back in the 90s, it was a transmission of HIV. And through being at this hemp store, there was a lot of people coming to the store looking for, you know, oh, I forgot to set my timer, otherwise I'm gonna keep chatting at you guys. Um, there was a lot of people coming to the store looking for information and looking for access. And so I literally started distributing cannabis with a bicycle and a backpack and a Motorola pager. And I am dating myself by admitting that we did not have cell phones then. So uh, quite a bit of time distributing cannabis, a bit kind of underground, and there's a crew of mostly gay men living with HIV and AIDS who were very politically active, who really encouraged me to come out of my cannabis selling closet. And I did, and they promised that they would have my back, and I promised that I would continue to have their back. And in 1997, the Compassion Club was born, which was the first medical cannabis organization in Canada. And we were the only one for quite a long time before other people had the courage to start breaking the law with us. The Compassion Club still exists today. It's um, uh, 23 years old, I guess, and is still civilly disobedient. 
Um, it doesn't fit into the regulatory framework that exists in Canada while it continues to strive. And um, that organization is a really, uh, it's a really incredible thing. A lot of people deserve uh, the credit for it. Part of what makes that organization so unique is we started a wellness center. So we started using the proceeds of the cannabis distribution to pay for herbalists and nutritionists and counselors and acupuncture and massage therapists and yoga programs and started being able to offer all of the cannabis therapies and education in conjunction with a holistic um, healthcare center. And we have really seen people's lives be transformed over the years by viral loads dropping and tumors shrinking and um, major transformation in people's lives. As we started fighting the court battles in Canada to get to a place where we had um, to, where, to where we have a, a regulated framework, we really dragged our government kicking and screaming and resisting every single step of the way. And when we got to the place in 2013 where we had a federally regulated market for medical cannabis and there were a small group of big companies being given licenses, I decided that I wanted to work in the legal framework, um, much to the chagrin of some of my activist community. I definitely am still on the receiving end of a lot of criticism for that choice, but that was my strategy. I wanted to work in the legal world. I wanted to create as much equal access for patients across the country and then start working on, really start working on the rest of the world. Um, once our government started talking about recreational access to cannabis. Um, we had a task force that toured the country uh, looking at talking to all kinds of constituents trying to figure out what their recommendations were going to be to the government about legalizing recreational cannabis. And I identified that they weren't meeting with patients. They had other special interest groups, but they weren't meeting with patients. And I think one example of you know, elevating and empowering patient voices to change the conversation in the public and also to change how our regulators are thinking, which the ASA crew are pretty experts at. Um, we, I rounded up a couple of my colleagues from other patient organizations, um, the Canadian Aid Society, the Arthritis Society, and we sort of circled the wagons with the government and said, you have to meet with patients. And at that time, the governing bodies of the physicians in Canada, the Canadian Medical Association, they were wanting to kill the medical system when the recreational system was coming into place. So our medical system, you get an authorization from your physician and then you order your cannabis online or it gets delivered to a pharmacy or to your doctor's office. And when we were looking at setting up recreational pot shops, um, they wanted to kill the medical program which for me as a patient advocate is really a problem. I want people having conversations with their physicians about cannabis. I wanna make sure that we're su supplying the products that patients need that can be quite different than the rec market. And so we made the government do a consultation with patients and we paid for it, we organized it, we hosted it. And that consultation with those patients transformed the recommendations that our government had to set up recreational legalization. And we ended up, because of that one meeting, having a two-tier system where we have uh, a recreational access system and we have a medical access system. Um, some of the growing pains in the early days when the rec came, market came online, there were some supply issues. Uh, there were some companies, particularly who did not prioritize the supply of pure, C or, or not pure, but of um, CBD products to for the medical market and that is something that uh, we have always been really strict about in terms of if we have to prioritize where particularly the cbd products are going that we have to make sure that they're they're available for for our medical clientele you know we continue to struggle in canada with unfair taxation uh, medical cannabis is taxed like any other um, over-the-counter medication, but it should actually not be taxed because you have to get authorization from a physician, should be treated like any other medicine, and we still have affordability issues. We don't have insurance coverage because the drug development process hasn't gotten to the place where we have a drug identification number, which is what we need in Canada in order for us to have insurance issues. So access and privilege continues to be an issue in Canada, where if you have money, you can afford all of the cannabis that you need. I'm just checking my timer. Um, 
And the one of the other differences is that we have storefronts for recreational access, um, but we don't have storefronts for medical access, which is problematic um, because a medical, pa a medical patient going into a rec pot shop, they're not going to get the kind of advice and guidance that they need. Um, so while there are issues that we need to keep addressing, I am incredibly proud of my government for having made the move to legalize all cannabis in this country. Uh, I think it's incredibly important from uh, social justice, a human rights, access to healthcare, and it gives us something to leverage when we're talking to other governments around the country. So around international advocacy, I think the most important thing that Canopy has done is support the work of ASA and the international arm. So we've had the great, great privilege of being able to provide some financial resources to support um, patients being able to get to Vienna and to be able to work with their delegates in their home countries. Um, Steph and I will be plotting out our strategy for this year in terms of looking at what I will be able to fund to keep supporting those international activities. Um, we've had the also the great privilege of supporting some amazing grassroots activists, um, a particular organization called Can Pass in the UK, who needed some seed funding to be able to turn their kind of grassroots activism into a proper um, advocacy organization and we continue to work with them and support them in other countries in Australia and a few other places we found one of the things that we could do was provide educational resources that they needed access to our guidebooks that we've built out for patients they needed access to all of the patient and physician facing education materials and the best way to do it is to just give it to them help them to scrub it to make it compliant and applicable for that region and then brand it as their own um, you know try to take sort of like the commercial interest for us out of it it's not a branding exercise it's about empowering as many organizations as possible to have great education assets um, we am talking really fast. It's interesting. If you were in front of me as humans, I know that I would, well, you are humans, but you're on the other side of the computer, but I know that I would be asking you questions and we would be able to have like a little bit more of a back and forth. So I'm just going to take a breath. This is my first video conference since the, the days of COVID. So really my hat's off to the ASA crew for, for pulling this together. I'm very glad we're still connecting. So we've, I've heard a lot today about the importance of research. Another one of the reasons why I chose to work for a massive publicly traded cannabis company is our capacity to fund clinical trials and to push forward some of the novel drug development um, that my, uh, the previous panelists were speaking about. And we have a lot of clinical research under, under the, under, in process, but there's a couple of projects that I'm really proud of. So one is we currently are doing research with long-term care facilities. I think that people who are in institutionalized healthcare are some of our patient populations that we still have serious uh, barriers to access in terms of being able to get cannabis into those facilities. So we actually created soft gel capsules just initially for the, I love my soft gel capsules. They're convenient and precise dosing and awesome, but we actually created them to get cannabis into long-term care facilities because the people doing the administration didn't want to be dealing with a vaporizer or oils or any of the other forms. And now we're running clinical trials looking at how um, C CBD and a little bit of THC is helping people in long-term care facilities with mood, pain, and sleep. And I'm very excited about those trials because I think they are going to help us break down barriers for patients who continue to not have access. Um, the other project that I'm really proud of and I didn't start my timer on time, but I think I have like two or three more minutes. Send me a text if I'm uh, running over time, but I just have one more thing to say and then I wanna play you a two minute video. So um, speaking of the opioid overdose epidemic, um, I think we all know and have heard patient stories and started to see some research around how cannabis can help people um, out of addiction, right? Um, so 
We are the epicenter of the overdose epidemic in Vancouver. This is the port where the fentanyl enters the content, the continent. And two, three years ago, my best friend's 17 year old daughter died of a fentanyl overdose. So I took some time off of work to take care of the family. When I came back to work, my boss said, well, what are we gonna do? What do you wanna do in British Columbia? How are we gonna make an impact? And I reached out to some incredible colleagues of mine and we donated two and a half million dollars to the university. The provincial government put in a half a million dollars and we created an endowment that supports the world's first professorship of cannabis science. And that professorship is running clinical trials looking specific, specifically at people with substance use disorders and how cannabis can help them out of addiction. Um, and we want to build a body of clinical evidence so that people who work with addiction and people with substance use disorders around the world have a gold standard body of clinical evidence to understand how cannabis is a tool to help people uh, and one of the tools to help us resolve the opioid overdose epidemic. So if I have time, unless I get a chat message that says it's time to shut up, I'm going to play you a video um, about that particular program that I'm really proud of. But before I play that video, which will be the end of my few minutes of speaking with you, um, I want to say that my provincial government did something incredible today, something that should have happened long before this epidemic, but long before the, the COVID pandemic. So in Vancouver, in the downtown east side, which is our community that is the most impoverished and the most hit with uh, multiple layers of diagnosis and addiction, um, the concerns about the transmission and the ability for people to isolate around COVID is really serious. And today the government announced that we are finally going to give out opiates by prescription to people who are living with substance use disorders. And so we should have done this a long time ago while you know people are dying in the thousands um, from a poison drug supply. And while this issue is slightly different than medical cannabis, these issues are very related to me. So I do want to give hats off to my government for, um, sorry, an announcement today that makes me really proud that is really, really actually going to save lives during this time. So a little bit, uh, teary thinking about like all of my friends who live in sh shitty tiny tiny places that hopefully now are going to survive and they actually can get um prescription opiates delivered to them during this time <laughs> sorry um so now i'm gonna grab some kleenex and um play you this video if i can remember how give me just a sec The current scope of the overdose crisis in Canada is quite simple. It's the worst public health crisis of our generation. It's hard to tell you how desperate people are because they know they might die. My best friend, Karma, her daughter named Gemma died of a fentanyl poisoning. Hillary's grief inspired Canopy Growth to fund this professorship with the hopes of supporting solutions to the overdose crisis. There's very few recovery places that will allow you to use cannabis. Really, there's no good treatments out there to manage that withdrawal experience, and that's a major barrier. We're not looking at what's actually happening for the people for whom this is their daily life. People living with substance use disorders are literally dying for solutions. The research we need now really must include the people who are living with stigma and discrimination. We funded the Canopy Growth Professorship in Cannabis Science because it's now becoming clear that people who use drugs are also coming forward saying we use cannabis for therapeutic purposes. And we're celebrating the one year anniversary of that professorship today. We made a decision to support the creation of a body of clinical evidence that may help people living with substance use disorders find new solutions. 
We need research understanding their lives, and they must be at the heart of the research and the heart of the response to the crisis. If we don't use those experiences to generate the research questions, we're missing a huge opportunity. They're giving us the answer. This year we published more than 30 publications, most now have to do with the overdose crisis. We have been really involved as well this year in doing work to prepare for our clinical trials. He's really focusing the research on proving what we're already seeing in clinical practice. Hopefully in the clinical trials, what we'll do is try and replicate the benefits that we've seen in our observational research through controlled administration of cannabis. I hope the research done in these clinical trials puts more tools the combination of the will to make significant change in society to address a massive public health crisis it gives me huge satisfaction to be able to participate in that process. That's it. I'm a few minutes over time, so I apologize to the organizers, and it's a great pleasure and honor to have had the opportunity to speak with you, and I can't wait to meet you all in person next year. Thank you so much, Lee. That was beautiful, and um, we are actually um, doing just fine on time, so thank you so much for sharing that video as well as, as, well as your story. It's very appreciated. Um, our last panelist, uh, uh, before we go into Q&A, um, is Dr. Pavel Pakta. Um, Pavel Pakta was uh, formerly the uh, Deputy Secretary at the International Narcotics Control Board, and he currently uh, works with me at ICCI as the Regulatory Director, and is going to uh, tell us today um, a bit more about what's happening at the UN level, um, but also um, what we're seeing at, at ICCI uh, for potential uh, model legislation. So with that, I'll hand it over uh, to Dr. Pakta. Welcome. So hello, can you, can you see me? Steph, can you hear me? Yes, I think you can. You can yes, see I can me. Answer and... you. Can you hear? Yes. 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 Welcome. Okay. So I'm I'm greeting you from from Vienna, Austria, small country in Central Europe. We are also uh, struck by by the virus, and uh, we are limited to our homes. And uh, I would say it's a great honor for me uh, to be even at this difficult time with you, with ASA, ACA, and with uh, the excellent colleagues uh, like uh, Steph and Hillary and uh, Michael and Nick at, at, uh, at, uh, and on this panel. So that's great. So I will try to say a few words about this international, uh, international environment. You know, we always speak about the importance of legislation. Laws are important. Your, uh, your law on narcotic drugs and psychotropic substances is very important for, for the life in your country, for, for the patients in your country. And uh, because cannabis is uh, considered globally as a narcotic drug, so then these national laws uh, in almost all countries all over the world are reflecting with respect to cannabis the provisions of the International Drug Control Convention, which is the so-called 1961 Single Convention on Narcotic Drugs. And allow me to say that this convention, of course, was adopted 60 years ago, reflecting the realities of the time. I think uh, my Kravitz has mentioned some political influences coming from your country also with respect to cannabis when this convention was drafted. But, uh, well, let's go to some facts. So this convention, uh, to attach to this convention are four schedules. And uh, the first schedule contains the standard narcotic drugs like is morphine, opium, cocaine, uh, f uh, you know, for example, also cannabis, oxycodone, fentanyl, etc. So, so these are standard narcotic drugs. Then you have the second schedule, 
uh, in this scale are drugs like codeine, which are considered less dangerous. And the convention contains provisions which should ensure, which should ensure that the drugs will be used uh, those in scale one and in scale two of this convention only for medical and scientific purposes, but this convention also obliges governments to ensure that these substances are available for medical use. So that's, uh, that's very important. So as I mentioned, we have uh, standard narcotic drugs in the schedule one, we have cannabis in this schedule, and uh, in addition to these two schedules, the convention has the so-called schedule three. In this schedule are included preparations which are containing very small quantities of narcotic drugs and which are therefore exempted from most of the control measures of the treaty. But in addition, there is a fourth schedule, schedule four of the 1961 convention and included in this schedule are substances that are considered particularly dangerous, so particularly dangerous, but having little or no therapeutic usefulness. So particularly dangerous, but having uh, little or no uh, therapeutic usefulness. And if you look which substances are in the schedule, so to our surprise, cannabis is there. When they were drafting the 1961 convention, they put cannabis in the schedule of drugs, which are considered particularly dangerous and with more or less no therapeutic use. The other substances in this schedule are, for example, heroin, this, uh, and there are some fentanyl analogs, uh, as was mentioned today, already very dangerous substances. Well, uh, many uh, people, well, uh, what, what is in addition stated in the 1961 convention? It is stated there that governments should consider for substances included in schedule four of the 1961 convention, some additional control measures, or they should consider even to prohibit their manufacture, production, their circulation and use. So the 1961 convention suggests the governments do uh, prohibit, prohibit the drugs which are included in scale four. What is interesting, the 1961 convention does not oblige governments to prohibit substances in scale four. It only invites governments uh, you know, to look into the situations in their countries and if it is appropriate to prohibit uh, these substances. Now, uh, we have cannabis there and of course uh, the uh, most of the countries in the world, it was in 1961, they simply reflected the provisions of this treaty and as they were obliged by this treaty, they, they transferred the provisions of this treaty into their national legislation. And with respect to cannabis, which was at that time considered not to have too many important medical uses, most of the countries gradually prohibited, uh, prohibited any use of the substance, any medical use of cannabis, including that in their country. So that was uh, the reality, that was the impact of the 1961 convention and of the level of knowledge uh, and uh, the, uh, let us say, the political, uh, political will of the most important countries of the time. Now the situation has changed, many advocates have um, you know, started to draw attention to the medical usefulness of cannabis and in this respect, you know, it was uh, mentioned here uh, that, uh, uh, that uh, you may, in the, I was following the panels before, and so on that uh, you may learn something from the countries outside the United States of America. But I would like to mention that, uh, uh, in fact, uh, it was very important what started in the United States of America, that you started with really enforcing or you patients started successfully enforcing medical, medical use of cannabis, started uh, from, uh, from uh, 1996, uh, 90, uh, I'm, I'm saying the date correctly. So great, so then started Canada 2001, uh, Israel with some activities with medical cannabis and uh, and uh, 2003, uh, there started uh, the Netherlands. So uh, some countries, uh, in some countries, in your country, unfortunately only on state level, not on federal level, some countries uh, legalized 
legalized the use of cannabis again for medical medical purposes. But what about this global position? Of course, these are a few countries uh, which have started with using can cannabis medically. But what about the other countries uh, which are still influenced by this international scheduling position of cannabis? So they have been voices, let us change it, let us uh, take cannabis from scale four of the 1961 convention. Let us delete it from that schedule. Now, how this can be done? This can only be done if this is recommended under the 1961 convention by the World Health Organization. The World Health Organization is considered to be the expert body on these issues of, uh, you know, uh, substance abuse. So this is the body under the treaty which may recommend such a change. And uh, it has been mentioned here already, and I would like really to emphasize again the big efforts which have been done by the patients in your country and uh, by, by Steph and by Michael and, uh, you know, which, who have been really uh, supplying uh, and providing, I would say, pressure and uh, providing knowledge and teaching people around the world about this issue and about the possibilities that uh, this would be good and there are good reasons for that to delete cannabis from this schedule of uh, very dangerous and therapeutic, uh, unuseful, non-useful substances. And I remember in, uh, two, it, was, uh, it was in fact in 2016, during your conference, ASA, ASA conference uh, in Washington, when you prepared this, uh, Steph has mentioned, this draft uh, review document, so-called critical review document of, on, on uh, cannabis, and you recommend it to, to delete it from the schedule four of the 1961 convention. And I, I, if I am correct, Michael was delivering that to the members of the UN Commission on Narcotic Drugs in Vienna, Austria. And I remember also Steph uh, writing a letter and sending this study uh, and this document uh, to the executive director of the World Health Organization, who was at the time a lady. And uh, um, uh, Steph was providing her with this letter and requesting uh, WHO, please look into it and uh, please, please recommend a change in the scheduling position of cannabis. I was per personally quite surprised that this worked. It was still in 2016 when uh, the World Health Organization mentioned, okay, we will do it. We will need two years for that. And we will look into the scheduling position of cannabis and its derivatives under the International Narcotics Treaties. And they, uh, they did this, they, they made this exercise and by, uh, at, uh, they finished their work uh, by the end of 2018. In January 2019, they made public their recommendations. And if they recommend something, so they send this recommendation to the so-called UN Commission on Narcotic Drugs. And this is a body which includes 53 governments, representatives, so representatives from 53 countries. And then these countries should vote on the recommendation of WHO. And uh, with respect to the derivatives of uh, cannabis, WHO made a couple of recommendations, but the most important one was to delete cannabis from schedule four, to take the stigma uh, of, uh, of uh, dangerous and non-useful drug from cannabis. And this was the key recommendation. Now, uh, now uh, the, the commission can say only yes and or no. Uh, it is the rule of the commission that uh, uh, to, to approve uh, the recommendation of WHO, it must be approved by uh, the majority of governments present and voting. The majority of government present and voting must be for that recommendation. And then it becomes a law and then it is implemented in the convention. While the governments were hesitant, there are some governments in this body of 53 which are opposing that change. Of why they are opposing, I think there is a kind of conservatism in many countries, a fear to change status quo, a fear of uh, uh, the 
uh, that this will help the proponents of total legalization of cannabis also for recreational use and therefore the countries like for example China, like for example Russia or Japan are expressing some conservation, uh, they have uh, uh, reservations with respect to that and they some would say well do we have to do it, is it really necessary, the 61 convention anyway only recommends to governments to consider prohibition, you do not have to prohibit, anyway you have it in some countries already, so why should we do it? And the, the situation is that they have not decided on the, on, in 2018, they had not decided on that also in uh, 2019, they have not decided on that also now during the last session in 2020, when they met in Vienna, Austria in March of 2020. But the discussion there finished with the decision, okay, we still need some more information, some governments are still not persuaded that this should be done, but let us, stay, let us uh, still discuss it and let's take the decision, let's vote in the beginning of December of 2020. So now it is really, uh, you know, I expect <clears throat> there will be a vote, there definitely will be a vote at the next occasion at it should be in December 2020. Of course, we do not know now with the wires whether there will be some even uh, changes to these, uh, to these schedules. Now, if you look at the composition of the Commission and of the countries there, I'm still at this moment not so sure that you will find this majority of countries present and voting. You know, because, uh, okay, the European countries are for that, uh, Australia and I don't know, Jamaica and Mexico and so on, but there are still many countries, and I mentioned already three big ones, uh, which are hesitating, there are countries in Africa, like, uh, for example, Egypt or Algeria, which expressed reservations, Kenya, Kenya, for example, uh, simply said, no, we do not want uh, this, this, is, uh, this would be wrong to do, to delete it from scale four. So uh, many, many countries which have not yet decided. I have just heard that Hillary and uh, uh, Steph will work together on advocating. I think it's very important this year to advocate. You, you have this list of 53 countries and you know their positions which they express in the Commission on Narcotic Drugs. I would think talk to those, especially for example in Africa, to go talk to countries in Latin America, in Asia, and try to persuade them. Look, uh, use the local patients organizations and try to explain to them that there is really no uh, legalization of uh, uh, recreational use meant by this deletion from scale four of the 1965 convention. This gives you freedom for, uh, for, um, for, this gives you freedom for, uh, Mm, uh, for approving it, but you you do not have to go into into the uh, uh, you know approving uh, recreational use, and so I would say that uh, there is still uh, a lot of uh, a lack of knowledge you know among the governments, lack of knowledge among the competent authorities, uh, and this uh, can be can be improved. I think very important is to talk to your government because your government will play definitely a key role and I hope that it will keep, uh, play a positive key role. The representative of your government, you know, uh, stated that uh, it's somewhat disappointed that there is no vote already now in, in March 2020. And uh, the US delegation also stated that uh, there must be a vote next time because the international community has really many, many uh, burning issues also in the field of international drug control. Uh, fentanyl was mentioned here, uh, for example, and so on. So many, many other difficult issues and should not lose all the time on the issue of cannabis. So I personally hope that if he was saying if uh, the delegation was saying we would be ready to vote already now, that they would vote for the approval of the recommendation. I hope so. But please, uh, ASA, be in contact with the authorities. It is really crucial that uh, your government is in favor of this change. Uh, if I have still, I think, do I have still four minutes? I hope so. 
uh, or yeah, uh, what what I expect if it is approved, I think the impact will be that the stigma will be taken away from uh, from cannabis. Uh, and that additional countries will become countries with a medical cannabis program. So uh, not, uh, you know, only the 40 countries which we have now with medical cannabis program, but that we will get other countries, additional countries to that. Stigma will be away. Then it will, uh, yes, you said that will maybe open the way to the, um, you know, uh, approval of medical cannabis in the United States of America. Uh, because uh, your authorities would say, okay, if the international convention says it may be used for medical purposes, why why not in our country? Well, so uh, great. Uh, uh, that will be a very positive thing. And I think what I really hope very much, this will help the research. So we have had already some optimistic news from the United States that there will be maybe more suppliers of cannabis uh, for research in your country. But if it is now recognized fully and reflected in your legislation, then there should be no problems with research. And uh, there should be a lot of research in your country. And there should be a lot of research in other countries which are not doing it now, like in France, like in, in China, like in, like in uh, Japan. So I hope that that would be a major, major change. And also a very good thing, if this is approved, this recommendation of WHO, very good thing for, for, think for patient organizations. You would get an additional argument. You would be able to say, this is a substance only in schedule one of the 61 convention as any other narcotic drug. And my government has an obligation to ensure its availability for medical purposes. So that would be, I think, also very useful. Now, uh, to finish briefly with this International Cannabis and Cannabinoids Institute, uh, you know, activities with respect to the supporting countries, if new, new countries are starting with, uh, with medical cannabis. Of course, uh, we uh, are ready to support them and we developed uh, 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 kind of uh, model legislation, which we can offer uh, to them, which we can discuss with them. We have had some contact with countries in Asia. We have had contact with countries in, in Africa, and we can provide them uh, with advice on how to establish their national legislation for medical cannabis. We do not want to suggest to them one model they have to take. We want them to analyze their national legislation, to start from their national legislation and to adapt it to the use of medical cannabis. And for that, we are prepared and we are uh, very happy to cooperate with the others in this area. And I think my time is um, almost over. So again, thank you very much for having me here. And uh, uh, it was great honor and I wish you good luck and uh, good health in, in the United States. Thank you so much, Pavel. I appreciate that. And thank you for that perspective. Um, I, I'm not sure if we're gonna be able to do, yes, okay. Uh, we're gonna have 10 minutes now for Q&A. Um, and so if all the panelists can come on. Um, I think the um, organizers are going to turn all the, the panelists on for Q&A. Hey there, I'm back. All right, I'm still I have five minutes. So um, one of the questions I'm just going to answer really quickly because I think this is something um, that people always ask about Americans for safe access is um, our view on scheduling. Um, this has been a huge controversial issue um, with a lot of misinformation. Um, and I'll just quickly say that ACE's position on um, rescheduling versus descheduling is that any change would be positive. And I know a lot of people think that the world would end if it, if it became scheduled too, it's just not true. Um, so any change whatsoever would be, would be good. And what we're advocating for for U.S. policy is actually uh, neither neither rescheduling or descheduling, uh, but rescheduling. So, so new scheduling. So what we're suggesting is actually the creation of a new schedule, Schedule Five A, uh, that would uh, require a doctor's prescription, um, but it would make it widely widely available to patients um, and would be able to be prescribed as a frontline medication. 
So it would put cannabis in, in the medical system uh, as is, would still require a prescription, um, but would, would not be in competition with uh, Schedule three drugs, Schedule two drugs that have to go through the FDA approval process. So that is, that is the, the official position at ASA, and you'll learn more about that this afternoon when we go through our model, our model legislation. Now I just have a, a question actually for each one of the, the panelists. Um, and so uh, Hillary, we had quite a few questions for you. Um, so we'll, we'll also ask that you answer some of those offline. Um, I think a lot of them are in the, uh, the, the chat queue. Um, but one um, that is actually something that's come up for me as well is that when we've been working at the international level, um, trying to change the scheduling of cannabis, um, the, the representatives from Canada um, have not been that supportive um, and have not been, been that uh, excited about medical cannabis. Um, and so we're just wondering, um, you know, if you have any insight of what uh, we can expect the Canadians to do uh, for this upcoming vote, um, or, if, or if there's a you know a, a process, or as you would say, a process uh, for getting those uh, getting those advocates uh, to uh, are getting those those representatives to take a stronger position uh, at these next very important meetings. Well, just, I mean, for context, I think it's important to remember that Canada sort of legalized cannabis with a bit of a prohibitionist mentality. Like the mandate that the government had was to get cannabis out of the hands of children and to get cannabis out of the hands of organized crime in order to reduce the harm of cannabis. That was the way that we sold it to the prohibitionists in power. We didn't legalize cannabis and go, shit, I'm so sorry. We have been unjustly imprisoning people and ruining lives for like 80 years. This was a big mistake. We are so sorry, right? We haven't quite gotten that far. So, I mean, in terms of our UN delegates, what we are hoping is that with the development of a really robust set of national data, we need to have the data to prove that the sky didn't fall. The roads are safe. There's not a, a onslaught of issues around addiction. Youth use is, uh, is not increasing or is in fact decreasing. Look at all of these economic benefits. So my hope is that when we have a little bit more time in a legalized environment to gather all of this data to equip our representatives with, they will feel better about being more proactive. I mean, our the Canadian representatives have defended what we have done when they have been criticized for it, but not necessarily been really proactive. Um, I don't have a clear line of sight into what we can expect at the vote. I am hoping for the best. I know that there is a tremendous amount of time and resources being put into um, trying to influence those people in the in the appropriate direction. If they vote the wrong way, I might stick a fork in my eye for how embarrassed I'm gonna be. Um, so um, hoping for the best and in the meantime, working really hard to fund some of the work that needs to happen to gather all of that national safety data on all of these, these different levels so that we can prove that the sky didn't fall and legalization is actually great for the country for many reasons. Fantastic, thank you for that. And um, Nick, this question is for you. Um, uh, love to hear um, you like Hillary who plays sort of both sides as being a patient advocate um, as well as uh, represent industry. And a lot of this discussion about changing international policy um, has really come from a, um, a patient perspective or an advocacy perspective. I was wondering if you can give us a little insight and what, what companies can, can be doing uh, to influence change uh, at, the, at the international and federal levels? Well, on the scheduling part, yeah, scheduling when it comes to patients and medicine, there's also the, the business aspect of that, of what, when we actually scheduled that meant. Like, so one part of this plant we really like, another part's really good for making fibers and you know, creating industry. So by scheduling it as strongly as we did nationally and internationally, we pretty much squashed the hemp industry as well. Scheduling is really important as well for pharmaceutical and drug development for what categories of products can be sold and, and how to protect 
um, patients that are taking those are higher risk type, type drugs. The idea of a new scheduling, I think, would be wonderful on a policy standpoint, because internationally, we'll just have to follow what, what's given at that standpoint. And I agree with Steph, anything is better. Descheduling, incredible. But then also that kind of opens up a lot of wanton chaos when it comes to actually pharmaceutical development of specific um, disease or condition based like medicines projects. So as an industry to be able to advocate, we have to know that that either comes through like business and lobbyists and some of those trade organizations or through the advocacy groups and the nonprofits, which surprising what nonprofits can do with such small budgets and props to ASA um, for what they've done for so many years, but also a big call. Uh, the lobbyist organizations are funded well from, from the industry, but we as advocates and industry members, we have to be a lot stronger to our brethren and sisters to try to get them into the industry in one way or another. So I think a call for change on that level, more membership to the organization here, more advocacy internationally to where we can provide more resources to like more people, more governments, more languages. That call that I even had last year, Americans for Safe Access is great for what we've done here, but like not everyone's an American. So it's like, how can we get more of a global approach with like our patient focused certifications? Um, because you're, if you're a person, you're a patient, you know, be it whatever country in the world that you're at, but we have to start getting behind getting the right information to the lobbyists themselves for business, as well as then these patient advocacy groups, because many don't have the right information and the false claims are their own side of the industry and how it protects them. But we got to get a lot more unified at the unity conference, but with proper distances between each other. All right, thanks for that, Nick. And Michael, last question goes to you. Um, we've got uh, two minutes before we're, we have to jump off. Um, I know a lot of uh, patients have asked me offline, online, just how how to get involved with something where it seems so huge. When you're talking about the World Health Organization, it seems like this um, almost fairyland place, uh, talking about UN policy, it seems so big and so out of reach. Um, so if you could just give uh, our members and uh, participants in the conference just a, a little you know, a little push in, in getting involved. I guess, uh, so there's two related projects. So uh, the first project would be to win this vote, of course, in December. We have a couple of intercessional meetings that will come up, uh, either reconvene session or intercessional meeting from the 63rd Commission on Narcotic Drugs. So you can text search that and you can look at all the documentation from the 63rd Commission, including the participants list and all the, the various documentation, including this cannabis review and the background. They put up some great background information there on the UN site. Um, we need help reaching out to member states and to try to make sure that member states that have a, you know, like I was saying in the chat, a strong history of traditional use of cannabis as a medicine in their own country, at least connect the dots and know that people are looking at them and watching them. And they, you know, if they're, if they're, if they know that, they know this important, this important vote, they know that it might win and they know that we're watching them. Those three things might actually get them to vote yes. So that's that. And then on the other side, very closely related, we're work net, working now with the World Health Organization Office on Traditional Medicines and Complementary Medicine and trying to connect the dots, bring them in as a treaty body within the World Health Organization treaty, treaty body to bring them into this discussion in Vienna on drugs. And we need help all over the world to really kind of capture this history of how cannabis has been used in the various countries. It's a heavy lift we haven't really written about as a movement how cannabis has been really used in all these various countries. When it's been used, who it's been used by, how it was used. We could use help in every country of, the, of those 35 I was talking about, member states of the 53 uh, countries of the CND, 35 have a long history of traditional use of, of cannabis as medicine. And we can really use help from each and every person out there to do the research and to help us create the background documentation that will educate the world about our own history about this plant. And I think that is the best way we can win this vote. Well, thank you so much for all of your work, Michael. And thank you all to my panelists. Uh, Pavel, we had a couple more questions for you, but, we, but I'm being told we're out of time. Um, so panelists will probably be sending you a, a few more questions uh, so we can send those answers out to uh, our participants. But again, uh, thank you so much. Stay safe and we'll see you soon. See you in DC next year.